It had been a long time coming, but the day had finally arrived. Now, 85 years old, the man who went against the word of the spies now stood ready to claim his promised inheritance. Forty-five years prior to this day, he stood with Joshua and the other spies on the other side of the Jordan. He had been sent in with other spies to check out the land. The Israelites had been delivered from the Egyptians, and now they stood on the border of the promised land, a land that God said would belong to them. Now that would be a pretty incredible place to be. Amen? Having seen God do what he did in Egypt, having seen what God did there as the Egyptian army was behind them and there was nothing but the sea in front of them and where there seemed to be no way, God made a way for them to safely cross and that same way brought total demise to that Egyptian army that meant to destroy them. Only God could do that. Come on now, church. Only God could do that. And now they stand on the border of the promised land. And the land is exactly as God described it would be. A land flowing with milk and honey. The spies brought back some of the fruit. And church, when you read the story, it is truly amazing. But then, then the reports regarding the people who inhabited the land began to circulate. Before we get to Joshua, let's look at Numbers chapter 13. This is the description that some of the spies brought back to the people. It says, The people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Before the Israelites could truly take possession of the land, the inhabitants had to be dealt with, cleared out. And these people were not looking to move anytime soon. Uh, I mean, they were pretty happy where they were. If we pause and think about it for just a moment, when you buy or rent a home, You do not move in until the previous family has moved out. It's a mutual transition that occurs as you take possession of your new living space. How many know what I'm talking about today? But this transition, this transition wasn't necessarily mutual. If the Israelites were going to take possession of the land, they would have to fight for it. This wasn't a matter of negotiating over final price and closing cost. This is a winner-takes-all, if you will, situation. The report that the spies had given regarding the inhabitants, it was in fact true. They were powerful people. There was nothing wrong with the facts that they offered the assembly that day, but there was everything wrong with the heart by which they delivered them. They had forgotten that God promised them this land. They had forgotten that God had promised them this land. We know today, church, that if God is in it, the work has already been done. Ten of us. Come on now. We know today that if God is in it, the work has already been done. The battle has already been won. They simply needed to continue to walk in faith and obedience as they entered into this new normal. So the spies began to spread this word. The people are powerful. It's going to be difficult, if not impossible, to overcome them. But then one man speaks up. One man steps up to the plate. And yes, he was a part of the group that went into that land. And his name was Caleb. And Caleb didn't stand up and dispute any of the facts given. 
But his heart in this, in this situation remained aligned with God's promise. And his response is seen in verse 30 of Numbers 13. It said he silenced the people before Moses. He took the stage. He had the floor. And then he declares this. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. He silences the assembly. He shuts down the words of the other spies so that his words can be heard clearly by everybody in attendance that day. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But immediately the other spies begin to dismiss what Caleb said, saying things like the people are stronger than we are. The land devours those living in it. The people are giants. They are of great size. In fact, they go on to say we are like grasshoppers in comparison. That comparison game gets them in trouble. Look how big they are and how small we are. Look how powerful they are and look how weak I am. How often does that game right there get us in trouble, church? Who am I compared to what lies ahead? And in response to the negative word, the people grumble and they miss their opportunity to enter what God had promised them. In fact, none of the people who witnessed the miracle in Egypt would set foot in the promised land because of this rebellion. Oh man, pastor, where, where, where's, where's the feely good message in this? Just bear with me. None of them would see the promised land, but God did not forget Caleb or Joshua in this moment. Specifically, God did not forget Caleb and his heart. Look at Numbers 14, 24. This is God speaking in response to what the people did after the spies gave their negative report. God says this, because my servant Caleb has a different what? Spirit. Because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly. There's the key. There's the key. Why did Caleb have a different spirit? Because he followed God wholeheartedly. Hold on to that. God goes on to say this, I will bring him into the land that he went to and his descendants will inherit it. So the rest of the assembly, because of their negative spirit, because of their desire to follow the negative words of the spies, instead of rise up as Caleb rose up, every single one of them missed out on the opportunity to enter the promised land that God had already given them. Because God was in this, the work was already done, but their heart wasn't following God. They were following God their own interests. Fast forward now 45 years, and we now find Caleb in the land that God had promised the Israelites. God made good on his promise. Fancy that. God makes good on every single promise he makes. Who in this house believes that this morning? There he is in the promised land. And at this point in history, they had fought and won many battles. The land was almost cleared out. There was one more battle to be fought. And before the battle takes place, Scripture gives us insight regarding an amazing conversation that takes place between Joshua and Caleb. Caleb, at 85 years old, 85 years old, declares that he is still as strong as he was when they spied out the land 45 years ago. Caleb is ready to see this through. Caleb, I don't think you're, he's ready to see this through. 
He wants to finish strong. Joshua 14, verse 7. I was 40 years old. This is Caleb. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt in fear. Where did the melting take place? In their hearts. I, however, followed the Lord my God. Look at this. Here's this word again. Wholeheartedly. So back in God's declaration as to why Caleb would be one that would receive this inheritance, it was because he had a different spirit because of his wholehearted pursuit of God. And again, Caleb says this, I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God. Here it is again, wholeheartedly. Caleb is ready to fight one more time, 85 years old, ready to pick up the sword. His age has changed. It's possible he didn't have quite as much hair as he used to. But his heart remained in the same place. His desire to follow God with everything he had was still there. Just as he knew 45 years ago that victory was ahead, he knew on this day that victory was just one more battle away. Verse 13 says, Joshua blessed Caleb, son of uh, Jephna, uh, Jeph Jephina. Oh my goodness, I can't get it out. I'm just going to keep on reading because I don't want to embarrass myself anymore. And gave him Hebron as his inheritance. So Hebron has belonged to Caleb, son of uh, Jeff, Jephina and the Kenzai. <laughs> See, now I'm embarrassed. So I won't be even... Anyway, Kenzai, ever since. Because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh-oh, here's that word again. Wholeheartedly. I like this last tag that's found in verse 15. Then the land had rest from war. This word, wholeheartedly, keeps popping up in this story, and it is not by accident. Caleb was all in. And I mean all in. There wasn't one part of this individual that wasn't following Jesus or that wasn't following God. Caleb made the choice to hold nothing back. He gave everything to God. When he made the declaration we can certainly do it. That declaration had nothing to do with what the Israelites' abilities or armies looked like. It had everything to do with his trust in God. Caleb knew that God was in this. Caleb knew that it was God who had delivered them from the hands of the Egyptians. Caleb knew that it was God who had parted the sea before them. Caleb knew they were there because of God's hand that day. And yes, before them stood a mighty enemy. Yes, the road ahead would not be necessarily easy, but if God said this is our land, the only thing keeping them from possessing it was in fact a lack of faith, not the battles to be fought. And how often do we hear from God then back down because of the challenges that may lie ahead? How often does our human reasoning and understanding stop us from entering into the new normal that God has for us? The difference between Caleb and the other spies that day had nothing to do with his strength or his age or his knowledge or his ability. Church, it had everything to do with his heart. Caleb followed God with his entire heart. A wholehearted pursuit of God means nothing gets in the way of faithfully following the Lord. Nothing. For the spies, church, it wasn't the size of the enemy that stopped them from entering the promised land. It was the size of their faith. And their grumblings, as you read that story, 
in their grumblings. They even go so far as wishing to have died in Egypt or in the wilderness instead of stand on the threshold of God's promise. They couldn't fathom why God had brought them this far only to die by the inhabitants of the land. But we know today, church, that God had not brought them there to die. He brought them there to receive. The land was as good as theirs. Again, if God is in it, the work is already done. And this morning we're going to briefly talk about what a wholehearted pursuit of God looks like because that was the difference between Caleb and the other spies. That is why Caleb now stood 45 years later in that same spot and said, man, I'm ready to go. At 85 years old, I'm just as strong as I was back then. And I really don't believe he's talking about his biceps, triceps, or quadriceps. I truly believe he's talking about his will to follow God with everything that he has. He was there because of his wholehearted pursuit of the Lord. And what we need to realize this morning, we need to ask ourselves this question, am I truly all in? Am I willing to hold nothing back? Or is my walk all but talk? Here's the deal, church. As we enter into the new normal, it has to be an all-in advance. We cannot withhold one part of who we are from God. Oh, come on now. Because that one little part that we might withhold, that one little thing that we might not be willing to let go of, that one little area in our lives that we think we can keep a secret and God won't find out or the world won't find out, is the open door for the enemy to come in and to spoil what God has for you. Compromise has no place in our walk with the Lord. Come on, it's awfully quiet in here. Turn these ACs down. We'll get everybody moving here real quick. Like a refrigerator sometimes, man. It's awesome. Anyway. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? Compromise cannot be a part of our walk with God. Because the moment we leave that door open just to crack, you might as well throw them wide open because that's exactly where the enemy's going to come. And in this situation, there they were standing on the threshold of God's promise. And one negative word stopped the entire assembly. Except for the two that stood against it and said, don't rebel. I'm getting ahead of myself. Don't rebel. And maybe that area in your life, just bear with me, Maybe that area in your life is where you would entertain a negative word from the enemy that would say, no, you can't. To which I would respond, you're right, devil. No, I can't. But yes, he can. Amen. We're going to look at what it means to wholeheartedly pursue the Lord. As Moses and Caleb and Joshua dealt with the grumblings of the people, there are three things that stand out in their response. We're going back to Numbers 14. This is what they said to the Israelite assembly as that negative word began to take hold. It says, The land that we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Here comes the caution in verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord... And do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. In this caution, we see these three points that I'm going to hit very quickly. Number one, do not rebel against God. What it means to rebel is to go a different direction, to go against a certain authority, the promised land was right there, and I do not believe that there was a single person in that assembly that did not want what God had promised. How many in this room, by show of hands, would say, I want what God has for me today? How many believe that? Okay? I don't believe there was a single person in that assembly that did not want the land that was flowing with milk and honey. I believe they wanted that. 
Are you following me? I believe if they were in this room and we asked that same question that every single one of their hands would go, well, of course we want it. Of course we want to be there. But, and that's where they get in trouble. Do you want it or not? Let's get real for a moment. Do you want it or not? Well, of course I want it. But I don't have enough time to do personal devotions. Oh, of course I want it. But, but the, the, these things that I do, I really enjoy them. They make me happy. Oh, of course I want it. But this, this, this church thing and these schedules, you know, I've got these other things going on. No, do you want it or not? Amen. Forgive me for getting passionate on this, but we're watching a nation going to hell in a handbasket and a church saying, I want what God wants, but that church being non-committed to what it takes to get what God has for us. I'm not just speaking HWC, I'm speaking the church in general today. The reason we have so much heartache and brokenness in this land, church, I believe this, is because we have overall a, a, a quietness that is happening spiritually, a church that has been subdued and that would lay back and that would rather just not engage instead of doing what God has called us to do. Jesus Christ himself called us to be a light, a city on the hill. Amen. Do we want what God wants today? And we've got to rise up. We've got to rise up and we've got to say, okay, Father. We've got to cut out these excuses. Oh, but the people are powerful. Oh, but the cities are fortified. Listen, church, our, ex our excuses compared to the excuses that the spies were giving are lame. Oh, you know, I just, need, I just needed another morning to be able to sleep in, or, or I, I, we just needed to go to an, a, another a community event. I'm not trying to bash these things, but listen to me. When these things are getting in the way with your walk with Jesus, it's time to let him go. Amen. This word, do not rebel against the Lord, as Joshua and Caleb brought it to this, to this assembly, all it took was one negative word for the assembly to get riled up to a point where they'd say, we would rather have died under Pharaoh's hand. God forgive us. I mean this. God forgive us of our rebellion that has been founded in excuses. Let me back that up. God forgive me I'll start it right here. For my rebellion, grounded in excuses. I know this is different, but this is where we're starting and this is where we're stopping right here. No music, no piano. Just us and God right now. God forgive me of my rebellion grounded in excuses. That's your prayer. I want you on your feet right now. God, forgive me of my excuses. I stand in this place. I'm praying for me right now. I stand in this place and I declare I want what you want. Yet I position myself accordingly. in different ways. God, forgive me of my rebellion grounded in excuses. I wonder if across this place you know what those excuses might be. You know what those things are that you may need to let go of. I wonder if right now all across this place that this could become a place of repentance right now. All across this place. Come on, church. If we could raise our hands and if we could surrender right now, these things that we know, that we know, I can tell you right now, busy schedule number one, getting in the way of things. I can make excuses all day long as to why I do things and the way I do things and why those things sometimes get in the way. No more. If I want what God has for my life, I have to re weed out those excuses and wholeheartedly pursue the Lord. Come on, you know 
you know what it is that might be holding you back. If you truly want what God has for your life, it is time to engage in that wholehearted pursuit of God. And this is not a place of condemnation. This is not a place of condescension. This is not a place of judgment. This is a time of turnaround this morning. Come on, church. Can we begin to pursue Him right now? God, forgive me. God, forgive me of my excuses. God, forgive me of any rebellion, God, going a different way. Of claiming, God, to want what you want, but then living a different way. Holy Spirit, I pray this morning in Jesus' name that you would quicken our hearts. God, that you would bring, Lord, conviction to us when we are doing differently than we should. And these things aren't necessarily always bad things, but if they are things that are getting our priorities out of adjustment, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring that conviction today. Because the number one person we want to pursue is you. Is you. Hallelujah. It's you, God. May we be like Caleb who stood in the face of the negative word and said, God is with us. May we be like Joshua, who tore his clothes in, 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 in grief and remorse and tried to lead an assembly, God, stuck on a negative word, tried to lead that assembly back to your promise. May our spirit be different. May our pursuit be wholeheartedly as we pursue your blessings and promises that you have in store. Forgive me of my rebellion that has been grounded in excuses. In this moment, Father, I truly believe you are resetting hearts. You are resetting agendas. You are resetting thoughts. You are resetting structures. How we live, how we view things. Most importantly, how we follow you. And I pray, Father, that not only in this moment, but the moment we walk through these doors, the moment we re-engage our culture and our society, when that pressure is on, that we wouldn't be tempted to go back to 95% or 95% or, or pursuit, but God, we would remain 110% yours. Yours. all yours. Bless my brothers and sisters. Bless this assembly as we continue to believe for the new normal that you have, not just for HWC, but God for the heartland. Because despite all of the headlines and everything that is going on, I believe, Father, you are setting this area, this region up for a mighty work of your power and your spirit. And God, I do not want to be left on the threshold. I don't want to miss what you have in store for us. And I don't want one of my church family members to miss it either. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to guide and direct us, lead us as only you can. But from this day forward, we're all in. How many would say that? I'm all in today. Hallelujah. So bless us, Father. Empower us, Father. And thank you, God, for your promises.